Thomas Jefferson wrote, if the American people ever allow the banks to control the issuance of their currency, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children will wake up homeless on the continents their fathers occupied. See, what the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 did was give this private banking cartel a total monopoly of printing money. So what you had here was a complete takeover of the government of the United States by these private bankers. They've owned it ever since. 100 years after Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln was pondering the same issues when he said, the government should create, issue, and circulate all the currency. Creating and issuing money is the supreme prerogative of government and its greatest creative opportunity. Adopting these principles will save the taxpayers immense sums of interest, and money will cease to be the master and become the servant of humanity. Uh, every $100 bill which uh, the Federal Reserve System prints and is sold to the United States at full face value represents a hundred dollar loan. Even though the government pays for it, they still pay interest and it becomes, that's what your four trillion dollar debt is, are the Federal Reserve notes. What do the fears expressed by Jefferson and Lincoln have to do with today's murmurings about something called the New World Order? And incidentally, it was Woodrow Wilson who first proclaimed the New World Order. It was the creation of the Federal Reserve that put the cap on this whole revolution, because that's what it was. It was a revolution that overthrew the traditional American system, the traditional government of the United States. There is a controversy raging everywhere in America today, everywhere that is except in our major media, a controversy that goes to the very heart of who we are. Are we citizens of the greatest democracy on the face of the earth? Are we captains of our own fate? Or are we merely pawns in the geopolitical strategies of shadowy international financiers? Financiers that may even control our own Federal Reserve. Do groups like the Bilderbergers, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Federal Reserve control what happens here in America? Tonight we're going to see some evidence that they might. Tonight we're going to see some evidence that there may just be masters of the universe. Tonight we will visit the scene of a crime so perfect that for almost 30 years no one knew that it had even taken place. The secret birth of a criminal conspiracy to rob not just one, but each and every bank vault in America, all at the same time. And in between, we've got wars, assassinations, and Martians. In fact, if it weren't for the Martians, you might have heard about this mother of all conspiracies long ago. At precisely 8 p.m. on the evening of October 30th, 1938, the Mercury Radio Network interrupts the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra for a special news bulletin. A huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fallen on a farm near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Moments later comes a correction. It's not a meteorite, no, but incredibly, Martian cylinders falling all over the country. The famous War of the Worlds broadcast has begun. Welcome to California. With its terrifyingly real descriptions of an invasion from Mars. And before the night is out, a million people will run panicked into the streets. But what has been for almost 50 years a closely guarded secret is this. Orson Welles' broadcast was no mere show business stunt. It was an experiment in fear, a psychological warfare test conducted for the Rockefeller Foundation. And when the results were published two years later, they were available to only a few well-chosen people, an elite whose very existence is denied in our mainstream media, who, safely hidden behind the curtain of history, may be pulling the strings of our government, our press, and even our Federal Reserve, may indeed be the masters of the universe. When you wave the white flag, you want to be friends? Hey there, open up, come on out. We're friends! Yeah! 
The psychological warfare test, which we discovered in Orson Welles' broadcast, is crucial to any understanding of why some people feel that elite institutions like the Federal Reserve, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Bilderbergers pulled the strings that we all dance on. The people who call conspiracy theorists conspiracy theorists are not the, are not the conspiracy theorists themselves, so to speak. So it's, um, we're talking about facts. We're talking about facts here. The Bilderberg Group does exist. The Federal Reserve does exist. The people who are members of the Bilderberg Group are also the people who do control the Federal Reserve. These are all facts. If a group can effectively control national governments, multinational corporations, and even our perceptions, they control the world. But the real founder, I believe, of, of the Bilderbergers was another man that I met through Jack Hines, uh, C.D. Jackson. Uh, and C.D. Jackson uh, was the then publisher of Life magazine. He had been publisher of Fortune some years before. Uh, and in between, uh, he, for four or five years, was the uh, equivalent of being the head of the National Security Council uh, in the White House under Eisenhower. He was the chief of psychological warfare. It all began here. This is Jekyll Island, just off the coast of Georgia where the immensely rich industrialist J.P. Morgan established the hotel behind us. Here is where representatives of the great banking houses of the world, Rothschild, Rockefeller, Kuhn Loeb, and House of Morgan met in secret to establish the Federal Reserve. Uh, the Jekyll Island story is one of the great untold stories of the, of the 20th century. And it was uh, these bankers who got together, left Hoboken in a sealed train and with the shades pulled down, and the reporters were going crazy. They knew this was big. These were five of the biggest bankers in the world getting on this sealed train. The reporters wanted to know what the hell was going on. They wouldn't talk to them. They, the train pulled out of the station, left the reporters there, and uh, they didn't know for years what had happened. Okay. It is the urging of the famous poet Ezra Pound that sets Mullins on his lifetime quest for the truth about the origins of the Federal Reserve. In the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., Mullins starts looking for clues. Mr. Pound's uh, young artists and writers' friends were killed during World War I. Ezra wanted to know why they died. Digging book by book, row by row, in the entire economic section of the Library of Congress, I found this little magazine with the uh, Jekyll Island story in it. When I took that to Ezra Pound, he was so thrilled. It was the biggest discovery of his life. He said, you have uncovered the biggest detective story of the 20th century. Why does Pound call Mullen's investigation the biggest detective story of the 20th century? Because I was tracking criminals. This is a criminal conspiracy. The Federal Reserve System, because of the way it originated as a secret conspiracy at Jekyll Island, in law, when, anything, when any people meet together, to plot to rob somebody, that becomes a criminal operation. It can never be anything else. Throughout its subsequent history, it can never overcome that initial criminal uh, beginning. And that's where we are today, a criminal syndicate. That's all it is. It's all it ever has been. Andrew Gray, grandnephew of one of the six men who met to plot the creation of the Fed, scoffs at talk of secret cabals. Well, I'm asked what, whether uh, the Jekyll Island meeting uh, can be automatically classed as a conspiracy. And the answer, first of all, is that the need for secrecy in conceiving important legislation does not necessarily imply conspiracy. Uh, we see this all, all the time. Uh, a very important legislation of any kind, particularly that which uh, has to do with changing the financial structure of the country, cannot be drafted in public forum by a, by a large roomful of uh, free debaters. The placid waters lapping these shores give no hint of the churning turmoil which events on this island caused throughout this entire century. Back in 1910, when the membership of the Jekyll Island Club represented fully one-sixth of the wealth of the entire world, the privileged sunbathers who came here were so secretive about this place that they used code when talking about it, even to friends. We're going to Jamaica, they would say, and those in the know knew this meant they were coming to Jekyll Island. 
where the conspirators who created the Federal Reserve were so worried about their plans leaking out that they formed what they called the First Name Club. So what they, they did was agree to address each other only by their first names. They would be, Warburg became Mr. Paul. Nelson, Aldrich became Mr. Nelson. And they kept that up religiously the whole time. They, I don't think they slipped one. And on the train, the senators swore all of them to lifetime secrecy. I mean, he said, I don't want any of you ever to say a word about this. And uh, this was honored by Warburg even 20 years after the senator's death. Beneath this stained glass window, a secret plan came into being that did much to shape the 20th century, and the details are only now becoming public knowledge. Uh, and, and this is a conspiracy. Uh, the, the birth of the Federal Reserve System, uh, we know, was uh, at Jekyll Island, uh, Georgia, in the secret uh, meeting that took place. The immediate excuse was the uh, money panic of 1907, which was engineered by Jacob Schiff and the Rockefellers uh, to, to gain control of some corporations they were after. History books record that Woodrow Wilson was the father of the Federal Reserve Act, signing it into law December 22, 1913, at the White House. All of the history books mention that Woodrow Wilson was the father of the Federal Reserve Act for a very simple reason. He was president at that time. He signed it into law on December 22, 1913, at the White House. And he was elected for that purpose. Now, the reason he was elected was we had, in 1912, a very popular president, a Republican named William Howard Taft. So Woodrow Wilson did not have much charisma. He was an educator, uh, had no popular appeal, hardly known outside of New Jersey. The bankers needed Woodrow Wilson to sign this act into law. He did not have much charisma. He had not a chance against William Howard Taft. The country was prosperous. Uh, who cared about Woodrow Wilson? So they drug Theodore Roosevelt out of obscure retirement, and Woodrow, uh, and so uh, Roosevelt formed the Bull Moose Party and split the Republican Party and uh, elected Woodrow Wilson. It was the creation of the Federal Reserve that put the cap on this whole revolution, because that's what it was. It was a revolution that overthrew the traditional American system, the traditional government of the United States. Because whoever controls the purse strings of a country controls the country. Years later, Wilson was to write that he had been deceived into signing the Fed into law, murmuring just before he died, I have betrayed my country. Uh, the establishment of the Federal Reserve System was always a conspiracy. The conspirators never told the public what they wanted. They said, we're going to give you banking reform. We'll give the farmers credit. There will be no more bank failures in the United States. Well, you know what a laugh that uh, was after 1929. Indeed, the Federal Reserve actually caused the Great Depression, according to no less an authority than Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman by deliberately reducing the amount of money in circulation. Less money, less work, less food, more misery. And prominent Congressman Lewis McFadden agreed, saying it was a carefully contrived occurrence of the international bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair so that they might emerge as rulers of us all. And Franklin Roosevelt's own son-in-law called the depression the deliberate shearing of the public by the world money power triggered by the planned sudden shortage of call money in the New York markets. Insider Joseph Kennedy's wealth grew, for example, from $4 million in 29 to over $100 million just four short years later. But then, as now, America's press failed to tell us what was happening. These scenes of unrest in America have never been seen before. Cameramen could shoot them, but the newsreels wouldn't play them. You see, controlling the news started early in America. As early as 1931, one Hollywood studio had decided not to use footage of strikes or unrest or anything controversial. But the lighter side of the news got, then as now, lots of play. This is the world's championship sneezing contest. The use of sneezing powder, snuff, 
feathers or ticklers to produce artificial sneezing will be prohibitive. Populists from William Jennings Bryan to Father Charles Coughlin weren't afraid to speak the truth. May I remind our president with all due respect that not one of these soldiers cast a ballot on that fateful Good Friday night in the spring of 1917 to force a peace-loving nation like ours to take up arms for the profiteers and the exploiters of mankind. And during the Depression, no one was more dangerous to the banking interests than Huey Long. According to the tables which we have assembled, it is our estimate that 4% of the American people own 85% of the wealth of America, and that over 70% of the people of America don't own enough to pay the debts that they owe. How many men ever went to a barbecue and would let one man take off the table what's intended for nine-tenths of the people to eat? The only way you'll ever be able to feed the balance of the people is to make that man come back and bring back some of that grub he ain't got no business with. Now, how are you going to feed the balance of the people? What's Morgan and Baruch and Rockefeller and Mellon going to do with all that grub? They can't eat it. They can't wear the clothes. They can't live in the house. Give them a yacht. Give them a palace. Send them to Reno and give them a new wife when they want it. That's what they want. But assassination as a tool of political policy was something this banking crowd apparently knew well, even in the 1930s. I thought cash is cash, and how can a dollar bill be an interest-bearing vehicle? What, but they're all uh, our interest-bearing currency. And you see both uh, John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln were murdered because they went to the Treasury and started printing non-interest-bearing currency, the greenback notes and they were immediately killed because the bankers didn't want to lose these billions of dollars of interest. Did the creation of the Federal Reserve represent a government takeover of the United States by shadowy international financiers? Certainly the Fed was designed to protect somebody's interest, but whose? Interest of the, of the uh, banking, the international banking community, not the American banking community. Uh, it was the international banking community. Uh, uh, the, the Morgans were an international family. Uh, the, 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 the fortune had first been made in England, uh, and then uh, they transferred their operation here. Uh, but they were allied with the Rothschilds uh, and others in England, and, and these were the people who drafted, uh, one of their agents uh, uh, drafted the script for the Federal uh, Reserve, uh, War Paul Warburg. Uh, and incidentally, uh, little known, is that Paul Warburg's brother was the chief of imperial intelligence for the Kaiser, all during World War I, while Paul was running the Federal Reserve. He was the vice chairman uh, of the Federal Reserve. The international character of the Federal Reserve has its defenders. There has been, in the last 30 or 40 years, a much greater international flavor to the activities of the Fed because the banking system has become global. And you could no longer regulate the U.S. banking money supply uh, by simply uh, uh, doing via the, the domestic Federal Reserve banks. But critics point to a famous statement in the early 1800s by Nathan Rothschild to support this claim. If I can uh, issue the money, I care not who makes the laws, because you always buy the lawmakers, and uh, the lawmakers are for sale. So if you have the money, uh, you can get any law passed you want. So who do you care who, whether uh, Bill Clinton is president or uh, uh, who is senator from New Jersey? It doesn't make any difference because you write a check and you get another senator. Nathan Rothschild in 1820 might have had more, more, had more right to say that than any of his successors. I don't, I mean, the statement is more or less absurd. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve does not control the money supply. The Federal Reserve influences the money supply. But the stickiest question in this debate is this. 
just who owns the Federal Reserve. Well, the city of London set the whole thing up. J.P. Morgan was simply an agent of the Bank of England when he organized this meeting down in uh, uh, Jekyll Island, Georgia. And uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, the stock is principally owned by five merchant banks in London chartered by the Bank of England. So you see, every decision of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, comes out of London. So then, who owns the Bank of England? Oh, uh, yes, the Queen of England was one of the original shareholders of the Bank of England. There again, you had another monopoly. Uh, most of the original purchasers of the Bank of England in uh, 1694, uh, their families have owned that stock ever since. And uh, it's a it's a monopolistic uh, oligarchy of dynastic families. Some of these families go back 5,000 years. These are not Johnny-come-latelys. These are not nobodies. These are real families. Hate mongers like Adolf Hitler used the term international financiers to spread anti-Semitism. Are critics of the Fed alleging it's a Jewish conspiracy? No, not really. It's uh, not Jewish at all. Uh, the Jews have been... Uh, what Lyndon LaRouche calls the Hofjuden, the court Jews. And uh, the uh, aristocracy of Europe always had their court Jews who would help them handle their money, uh, tell them where to put it to make money, and that sort of thing. And so they always had their Hofjuden. And uh, so <clears throat> the Jews have been very visible in all this. And of course, the Rothschilds themselves are Jewish. But the Rothschilds have very little in common with ordinary Jewish families anywhere in the world. But the hideous allegation made against the shadowy figures who run America's Federal Reserve is that they have been responsible for the two biggest tragedies of the 20th century. The Federal Reserve is the biggest story of our time because the Federal Reserve bankers uh, set up both world wars. See, they had been trying to have a war in Europe since 1885, but the central banks of Europe had already bankrupted all the nations of Europe. They had no money. The only money was here in the United States. In order to get that money, they had to put a central bank over on the American people. There is no question that war is a profit-making business. Uh, after World War I, uh, Senator Gerald Nye held very famous hearings here in Washington where he dragged in some of the biggest bankers and industrialists and. Uh, and put them on the spot and just examine profits that were made by some of these major interests here in the United States alone. And these, these, I mean, everybody has the image of the arms dealer. Well, yes, arms dealers do profit from war. So do the banks that lend money, the international banking houses that lend money to, uh, to various governments so they can finance their war efforts. Yes, war is a profit-making business. Anybody who uh, says otherwise is a liar or a fool. They were able to manipulate us into World War I, and as a matter of fact, uh, the war uh, stretched out for at least another two years beyond uh, what it would have gone. Well, it certainly was the case, and in fact, I have a, a, a book on it uh, here, uh, which documents it uh, very carefully, based upon uh, Senate and House uh, uh, committee hearings that, were that took place in the aftermath of World War I. Uh, and so th there's no question that, that they did this. They did this knowingly, uh, with malice of forethought, uh, to strengthen their own profits and to build their own institutions, their own banking uh, institutions. Well, th th many, many people believe that wars, and, and I'm really among them, uh, I have to say, many people believe that, uh, that virtually all of the wars of this century, the major wars, the not so major wars, have been caused for a purpose, that they have been caused for uh, reasons to benefit small financial groups, such as in particular those that uh, move in the sphere of influence of the Bilderberg and the Trilateral Commission. And that uh, while we, you know, we were told that we were fighting to stop communism in Vietnam, uh, well, you know, we fought for how many years in Vietnam and uh, nothing happened there. But there are a lot of scholars who've looked into Vietnam and they can find uh, find traces of oil and traces of gold and uh, traces of drugs and all sorts of other uh, all sorts of other commodities that have been uh, traded behind the scenes by the people uh, controlling that war so just take take a look at Vietnam alone and uh, 
there's much more to the story than has been told to the American people or to the poor beleaguered people of Vietnam. A conspiracy so powerful that it was able to cause two world wars must have a clubhouse somewhere, must hold regular meetings. And if you've never heard of the club called the Bilderbergers before, it's for only one reason. They haven't wanted you to know. The first meeting took place under the chairmanship of Prince Bernard of the Netherlands at the Bilderberg Hotel in Oosterbeek, Holland. Ever since, the meetings have been called Bilderberg meetings. The newspaper The Spotlight in Washington, D.C., almost single-handedly began a relentless yearly assault on the secrecy shrouding these meetings, which no other media outlet had even bothered or maybe been allowed to cover. What really fascinates me is the complete blackout in the American press. For more than 20 years, I've gone down to the press club every day. I check the wires and so forth in their library, mingle with other paper boys, and I asked them the question many times, why, when if uh, 120 film stars or 120 NFL football players met behind locked and guarded doors at a remote location for three days, you'd try very hard to penetrate and find out what those movie stars or football players are doing. Why well, no curiosity at all when 120 of the world's most powerful financial leaders and political leaders meet for three days in a remote location behind armed guards in a complete blackout. Why no curiosity? At this Bilderberg meeting, Americans present included Secretary of Defense William Perry, Presidential Advisor Stephanopoulos, Senator Sam Nunn, William Buckley, David Rockefeller, Lloyd Benson, and Henry Kissinger. And major agenda items included the role of liberals in various organizations since a month before 50 liberal groups had met in Washington to discuss their opposition to international banks and economic globalization, as well as the separatist movement in Canada and the expansion of NAFTA from Alaska to Chile. Yet here in its entirety is the respected Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's coverage of the Bilderberg meeting. It used to be a luxury resort where people came to forget their troubles. This weekend, international heads of state and business are here trying to solve the world's troubles. And police are ready for any intruders causing trouble. There is actually quite a bit of security, but it's discreet. So what would happen if somebody tried to sneak in through the, uh, the trees back there? I don't know. I wouldn't want to try it. 120 world figures are here, including the Prime Minister, Finance Minister Paul Martin, former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, and U.S. Presidential aide George Stephanopoulos. Newspaper magnate Conrad Black is hosting something mysterious called the Bilderberg Conference. The meetings here are very private. There are no resolutions, no votes, nor policy papers, and definitely no interviews for reporters. Few people in King City know what's going on, but many people are speculating. What they're probably doing is just discussing, you know, political policy. They're probably trying to figure out how to spend our money. <laughs> no, I don't, think, I don't think they're into barbecues and beer. They're more into uh, caviar and uh, champagne. Bilderberg in particular is, is, an, is an organization created in the 1950s which was designed to try and ensure Atlantic unity and also a stable and growing world economy. This political science professor has written about the secret of Bilderberg Conference. The major justification for the secrecy is, is to allow people from very different uh, uh, political contexts and walks of life to exchange views frankly over sometimes very difficult issues. Simon Dingley, CBC News, King City, Ontario. Why is it the major media would deny this? Uh, let's look at the ownership of the major media. Let's look at the roster of, say, the Bilderberg meeting. Catherine Graham owns Washington Post country. Catherine Graham has been to the Bilderbergers. Conrad Black, one of the largest uh, media barons in Canada and Europe. Conrad Black has not only been to these meetings, but he has hosted the meeting just a few years ago. Uh, and, and this is a conspiracy because every year they meet in secret. The press never reports on it, even though people like Catherine Graham, the longtime publisher, uh, owner of the Washington Post, uh, has been to almost all the meetings, uh, even though uh, representatives of the New York Times have been to all the meetings, uh, the Wall Street Journal 
and, and, the, and the other top newspapers in Europe and Japan as well. And there is an absolute news blackout. There is never anything reported in any of those papers. In this country, the press is seen as the fourth estate. You know, you've got the judiciary branch, the legislative branch of government, the executive branch of government. Then you're supposed to have the press keeping an eye on these three. If leaders from these three are working with other leaders around the world to determine economic policy, to determine wars, to determine what people will have human rights, etc., then yes, the press has a responsibility to get in there and to inform people. But just two years ago, I think 1997, the First Lady attended the meeting in uh, Georgia, in Atlanta. The pre now, a few papers in Georgia picked it up. A couple of these papers are, are part of national chains. It appeared here and there, spot coverage throughout the country. But this is the First Lady at a meeting with, with people who really arguably want to rule the world. Now that should have been front page news. Have the Bilderbergers corrupted the press? Is the public's right to know snickered at behind our backs? Reporters who hobnob with the Bilderbergers comprise a virtual who's who of journalism. Everyone from Peter Jennings to Leslie Stahl, from Rune Arledge to the only journalist present in Dealey Plaza, Dan Rather when John Fitzgerald Kennedy was murdered. Could this explain the curiously incurious attitude of the American press towards the assassination of the last legitimately elected president of the United States? A sinister conspiracy to one person might just be another person's private affair. It's just that when you get people to, you know, going on and on about this or that, you, uh, you, 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 oh, it, it just isn't what a club is, is supposed, to, supposed to be. I can, the Bilderberg is a, is, is a clubby atmosphere. That's what it is, really. It's a clubby, a clubby affair. By invitation only, that kind of thing. It's an elitist institution. Sure. Well, of course it is. Of course it is. Uh, now, when you see uh, groups like Council on Foreign Relations, Bilderbergers, Trilateral Commission, you have to remember bankers work internationally. No banker just works in one country. They work in all countries. And the central banks in all countries work together through special groups. They, they formed the Council on Foreign Relations at the uh, Versailles Peace Conference after World War I. Now, many uh, conservatives believe the CFR runs in the United States, but it only does it second hand because the real power, uh, the real orders come out of London first. The decisions made in Bilderberger meetings apparently affect all of our lives. Well, by penetrating the secrecy of Bilderberg, we were able to do an advanced story on the end of the Cold War, on the downfall of Maggie Thatcher, oh, many things, oh, we, an advanced story on the Persian Gulf War on uh, Bush's, then President George Bush's reversal from his Read My Lips, No New Taxes pledge. Seen in attendance at a Bilderberger meeting are all of the usual suspects. The financial entities that uh, dominate uh, the Federal Reserve, the Bilderberg Group, uh, are largely centered around the Rockefeller family and the Rothschild family. Uh, names such as Chase Manhattan, uh, Citibank, First National Bank of Chicago, I believe. All these groups that move in the Rockefeller sphere of influence and the Rothschild sphere of influence are the glue that hold the Bilderberg elite together. When Nelson Rockefeller was heckled at the 1964 Republican convention, commentators chalked it up to right-wing extremism but could these people have known then things we are only learning now? Their tactics have ranged from cancellation by coercion of a speaking engagement before a college to outright threats of personal violence. Audience and I'll make my five minutes. 
Most troubling of all is the evidence that these secret elite meetings may even choose our presidents. Jimmy Carter had been a one-term governor of Georgia, uh, hardly known to the American people. Uh, uh, he, uh, however, had an entree into the international elite through his membership in David Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission. No one had ever heard of Jimmy Carter. I think that's fair to say. Yet, within the next several years, as he announced his presidential campaign, started moving towards a Democratic presidential nomination, he started getting a lot of favorable media coverage, particularly from media connected to the Rockefeller sphere of influence. Carter was painted as a populist, a man of the people, when in fact uh, he was moving in the highest circles of the international elite. There are even more recent examples of the Bilderbergers selecting people to become our leaders. When we discovered that the obscure governor of uh, Arkansas, Bill Clinton, had attended his first Bilderberg meeting in Baden-Baden, Germany in 1991, we were able to anticipate a political future for the young man. Uh, when, I, when I discovered in 1991 uh, that, the Bill, that uh, an obscure uh, governor of Arkansas named Bill Clinton had attended the Bilderberg meeting, I was able to predict that he would be the candidate for the presidency of the Democratic Party. I didn't think he'd be elected president, incidentally, but he was. Uh, and so they picked him. The Bilderbergers actually picked him to be the president. Bill Clinton, like Jimmy Carter, is a product of the Rockefeller empire. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, uh, has a few up on Jimmy Carter, though. Not only was uh, Clinton a member of the Trilateral Commission, but he was also invited to become a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, he also was inducted into the Bilderberg Group at its meeting in Baden-Baden, Germany in 1991. Bill Clinton was, so he essentially had the, uh, he had the uh, imprimatur of the Rockefeller and Rothschild families and he had the appropriate backing uh, and he knew it. He's a smart guy and, uh, and that's how he got in the White House. I have no doubt about that in my mind. They put him there. If there is a conspiracy loosely called the New World Order, the free movement of capital and goods across national boundaries is clearly a big part of their agenda. The global elite have been uh, some of the primary promoters, in fact the primary promoters of free trade precisely because of the fact that they are the ones who control the major multinational corporations. They are the ones who want to build televisions in Mexico and in, in, in uh, third world country, impoverished third world countries and pay these people who otherwise have no employment. They want to pay them at sub, sub minimum wages, slave wages, and then export them at gigantic profits back to the United States. And, uh, but we're told by the major media in this country, which is tied in again with these international elites that, oh well, this is a temporary thing. It really is good for America, but it's not good for America. Look at anybody who's lost their job. Look at how their family suffers. That's the Bilderberg Group at work. That's the Trilateral Commission. That's the Federal Reserve, all these elite groups that they're benefiting, but the average American isn't. Critics of the American CIA have long accused it of operating not in the best interests of Americans as a whole, but of being a virtual private army for multinationals, as well as being heavily involved in the drug trade. Could they be actually working for this sinister conspiracy? These families have been mostly in the banking business for at least 500 years, most of them. And uh, uh, they're always in international trade because being in the banking, you can finance uh, foreign voyages, uh, go and uh, trade in spices and whatever you want. And so as uh, bankers, they became traders and they get richer and richer and richer. They were in the slave trade. Uh, they were in the opium trade because uh, these people are not interested in 5% a year return. They want a 1,000% a year return. And to get into those things, you need, you need to get into gold, slaves, drugs. Uh, that's where the big money is. We are back to our initial question. Are we citizens of a great democracy, or is something more sinister at work? Is there anything wrong with the best and the brightest controlling our country? What's wrong with an elite ordering world events? Uh, there's a lot of things wrong with that. The American people, at least, have always been told that they 
control their own destiny through their elected representatives. But uh, when you find their elected representatives attending secret meetings with some of the wealthiest bankers, industrialists, uh, behind closed doors, uh, surrounded by armed guards who will not let the general public in, and they're making decisions that affect the future of the American people and the, Amer and the people of the world, then, then there are legitimate questions as to uh, why this elite should be able to dictate things. Are international financiers in control of our lives? Are they the masters of the universe? Well, they print the money. I mean, if you could print a billion dollars tomorrow, well, you could be a master of the universe. But you can't because they have the monopoly. And as long as they can print the money, as long as they can buy the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, congressmen, senators, presidents, uh, then you can't compete against them. Well, what have you got to offer? <laughs> if you have uh, just a very few people, relatively few people, um, uh, governing uh, your government, uh, you don't have a democratic government, do you? You've got a secret cabal here who is g governing uh, the United States. And not just the United States, but the governments of England and France, Germany, uh, all the European countries, uh, less influence in Japan, but quite a bit there too. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, what, what'd you, what would you call it? Uh, uh, it, it it's a conspiracy. What, what else can you call it? It's a conspiracy against the people of the United States and of the Western world. Are the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the people in their sphere of influence the masters of the universe? That's an interesting question. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, they want to be the masters of the universe, but there are a lot of people who don't want them to be. It's only fitting that we end with a quote from the man who started it all, Woodrow Wilson who, as we have seen, spent his remaining years regretting what he had done. We are controlled by a small group of dominant men, he said. The worst ruled and most completely controlled government in the civilized world. Some of the biggest men in the United States are afraid of something, he went on. They know that there is a power so organized, so subtle, so interlocked, and so complete that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. So, is there a sinister conspiracy in control of our lives? Are there masters of the universe? Democratic societies have always been the crowning glory of human civilization. And in a democracy, the people decide they don't have their decisions made for them. Masters of the universe, you've seen the evidence. You decide.